wife says I don't talk about that, so I need a mic. The names of the days of the week mostly come from Babylonian Egyptian astrologers, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so forth. Sunday, uh, supposedly named by the Roman Emperor Constantine, uh, called it the Day of the Sun, S-U-N. New Testament simply refers to it as the first day of the week. We know that Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Early disciples met uh, on the first day of the week to commemorate his resurrection. There's also Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, which is the 50th day after Passover. It's also the first day of the week. The same day that disciples received the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 after uh, Christ ascended back to heaven. We follow aside the examples of the early disciples. Uh, we meet on the first day of the week and we're commanded to uh, partake of the emblems in remembering Christ and his uh, sacrifice that he made on behalf of all who well, on us and all who will follow him. And Paul says, uh, Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and said, Take eat, this is my body, this is broken for you, do this and remember to me. Likewise, he took the cup, the new covenant, this is it, this is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <coughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you we have this opportunity to come together that we can uh, assemble around this table of remembrance and to Remember that Christ died for the sins of all who will follow in his way and, and for the uh, freedom of, uh, from sin that we have and that hope of heaven that, that we have. Oh, I ask you to be with us in our service today that all that we say and do will glorify you and honor you in our presence. Thank you for Jesus in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Well, once again, good morning. Let's stand this morning as we worship our Lord and Savior. <laughs>
you're visiting, we want to say uh, uh, just that we're so glad that you're here this morning and uh, glad that you chose to come worship with us. We do have a board meeting, and that is tomorrow, Monday, uh, August 9th at 6.30, and that is over in the church basement. And as always, our board meetings are always open for everyone. We'd love to have your input. Uh, love to have some uh, uh, people come and be a part of that. And that, as I said, is at 6.30 tomorrow over in the uh, church basement. Um, we are now adding birthdays and anniversaries to our announcement slide. If you came in here early, earlier, you would have seen that uh, we have birthdays and announcements on there. And if you want to make sure that yours is added on there, please see Julie Boyle. She's doing all of our PowerPoint for us. Doing a wonderful job, too, Julie. And uh, just thank you so much for that. As always, you can check out all of our announcements at our website at mycclife.com. All of our uh, lessons, announcements, postponements, anything will be on there. Unashamed is meeting on Mondays from 6.30 to 7.30, and that dinner is included with that. Are we meeting this week, Zeph? Yes. So Unashamed is tomorrow evening, 6.30, right here in the Life Center. Life Group is meeting this Wednesday, and that is at 6.30, uh, over at the church in the basement. And uh, we will have some child care uh, to be provided there, so if you want to come be a part of that. Uh, I know that we are in between sessions right now, so this week I think our Life Group, we're doing some uh, uh, biblical principles uh, via the Andy Griffith Show. So... It uh, ought to be an interesting life group. Come be a part of that. We have a meal beginning at 6.30. Love to have you be there. Uh, there is some zucchini over here at the door. Uh, left a bunch of that. If anybody doesn't have zucchini. I heard a joke the other day. Somebody said you don't leave your car windows down in Indiana. Because if you do, somebody will fill it with zucchini. And that might be true right now. I think everybody's got that. Uh, there's also a card here from Carol Bruff I wanted to share this morning. And uh, as you know, uh, Carol's had a lot going on in their lives, moving to Texas. They've had the birth of the twins and her father died. She said, uh, thank you so much for all the prayers for my family uh, during our past month. Said my dad's passing and the twins being born. Uh, the, the, the planner that we sent was so pretty. I really appreciate all the prayers and miss you and love you all. And that's from Carol Bro. Do we have any other announcements this morning that you would like to share? How about prayer requests? I know we have a lot of prayer requests. Yes. Um, I just want to put Adam Humphrey on the prayer list. He He's my age. He's 41. He had an brain and cousin. He had a heart attack Monday night. Um, they weren't able to do the heart cath until Friday due to his kidney function. And then Friday found out that his heart cath was not good, and he's waiting transfer to Indianapolis for a heart transplant. Oh, wow. So we want to pray for him in Jesus' name this morning. Any others this morning you want to add? Yes. I got a praise. Awesome. We love it. I saw that. Cooper Ryan. Cooper Ryan. Praise the Lord. We love, love, love having babies. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Yes, family. Larry King. Larry King. Okay. We're praying for him in Jesus' name this morning. Uh, we, of course, we want to keep Sandy in our prayers also. I know Sandy's doing much better and on the road to recovery, but still got a long road ahead of her, so I want to keep praying for her. Any others this morning that you want to share? Yes, Sandy. I'll be praying, uh, I'll be praying for them in Jesus' name this morning also. Michael. I have praise. I wrote him that I heard him as cancer and women's illnesses. And he's been better going.
ask for their healing and, and uh, they might be back to some uh, level of normal and they should be in their lives and that they would really like to be able to Father, we, we do believe in, in Christ and, and the sacrifice that he made on the cross and we believe in the resurrection and that's why, why we're all simple here together. We might have that hope of being resurrected ourselves one day and to, to see that. Uh, heaven is our home again. Father, we uh, ask you to the beautiful leaders of the church here and, and uh, all of the churches who are serving you and to watch over guys and give them knowledge and strength and leadership. And Father, especially here, to bless these ones and, and the decisions they make and the guidance of our young people that they might all uh, lead them to be a future church. Father, we ask you to be a great message and be enlightened and strength in your own. Thank you, God, for all we do and give us the time of our week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing this morning as we continue with our worship.
Psalm 19, a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet in their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world.
Well, good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. You know, every time that we sing that song, How Great Thou Art, it takes me back to a time when I was a child and in church and, and standing there and I could see my grandmother standing there worshiping my mom, my dad, all my family standing there worshiping me. It just, it really just ministers to my soul. I just, I love that song, How Great Thou Art. How can we, how can we worship a God more than that? How great He really truly is. Now, Today we're actually beginning a brand new series. I'm really excited about this series. It's called Voices in My Head, because I've had voices in my head a long time. So that should, yeah, no, not really. But, yeah, probably not. But, but it's called Voices in My Head and In My Heart. We're going to be talking about applying some biblical principles to our lives and saying no to the emotions that actually compete for our control. And, and the good thing is this, and we all have this in common. None of us really enjoy being told what to do, do we? None of us, none of us really be, enjoy being told what to do, whether it's an emotion inside of us or someone on the outside of us. Uh, but none of us really enjoy being told what to do. And we discovered this very, very early in life. If you're a parent out there, you know this sort of thing. It's kind of built into us that, that we don't like to be told what to do. In fact, one of the first words it seems like the kids really learn is the word no. No. And, and I don't know about you, but, but I've, I've learned that, you know, through parenting, you kind of have to discipline your kids out of that. In my case, that meant a lot of whoopings from my dad. And, and I don't know that, that I ever really did give in to that, you know. I, I just don't like being told what to do. But this isn't just a kid thing. This is an adult thing, too. I mean, when you really think about it. The American dream is all about having autonomy. It's all about having the power and the money to say no to whoever or whatever we want to say no to. You know, I, I know that's just the American dream for us. You know, autonomy is, is what I want to do and when I want to do it and have enough money to pay for it or at least enough money to get me out of trouble when I get into trouble and I get caught. There's just something in every one of us that wants to be in that position where nobody tells us what to do. It's just an alluring goal, isn't it? And the reason that it's such a tempting and alluring goal is that we're all convinced that once I can call all of my own shots, you know, I'll get all those shots right. I'll get everything right. And we know just by looking at our past history that that's probably not going to be the case. And the reason that I know that this is true and you know this is true is because most of the decisions that we make, good or bad, they're not based on our wisdom. They're not even based on good information as we talked about in our last series. You know, most of the decisions that we make are based on our emotions. Those voices that shout the loudest in our heads and the loudest in our hearts. And the truth is for all of us is that we don't get in trouble because we don't take advice. Okay, we, we, when we take advice, we don't get in trouble. Most of the time, we get in trouble because we take our own advice. And our own advice is always, and, and really there's no way around this, but our own advice is always filtered through those emotions that have the possibility of distorting reality for each and every one of us. This is why people will look at you when something goes wrong and say, you did what? Yeah, you did what? And then later, you look at yourself in the mirror and you think, I did what? You know, what was I thinking? What was going on? Why did that happen? Because there is inside each and every one of us a tendency just to take our own advice, to listen to ourselves. And our own advice is always filtered through our emotion. Now, here's the thing. All of us, because we are adults, we have learned to monitor our behavior. All of us have learned this. I mean, we're really good at that. We're really good at monitoring our behavior so that we can do well at job interviews. Uh, we've learned to monitor our behavior early on as teenagers and curb our behavior so that we can actually get dates, get second dates, get third dates, maybe even get married so we can stay married. We've monitored our behavior. And so that we can actually get people to do the things that we would like them to do. We've all learned to monitor our behavior. But then along comes Jesus, and, and, and this 
just kind of as a side note, this is why I think you should consider becoming a Jesus follower, even if you're not sure about everything in the Bible or everything in church. Along comes Jesus, and he invites us, just as he invited his first century follower, he invites us to begin, begin looking and take, uh, monitoring our, our emotions to a whole new level. He actually raises the bar with this. He invites us, and this principle that we're going to be looking at is really more of a command, so he commands us to look past simply monitoring how we behave and to begin to monitor what's actually going on inside of us. Now, if you have your Bibles and you'd like to read along with us today, we're going to be going to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew is the first gospel, and of course we'll be going some uh, uh, scripture on the screen. Uh, Matthew is the first gospel, so as you're looking through your book, when you get to the New Testament, Matthew will be first. Chapter 15, and here's kind of how our adventure begins. Jesus is with the, the guys that he has chosen, and... We, we said this early on, that when you read the gospel, uh, there were these apostles. These apostles were Jesus' chosen folks, so to speak, the guys that he had chosen to follow him. And then there were the crowds of people. <clears throat> and these crowds of people seemed to go everywhere that Jesus would go. And in fact, when you, when you read the book of Mark, I, I love this. When you read the book of Mark, if you just pay attention... Look at how many times Mark mentions the crowds. Almost every single chapter in the book of Mark, Mark mentions the crowds that follow Jesus. So Jesus has his, his followers that we, we know become the apostles, and he has his followers that he calls disciples, even though they're not the twelve chosen disciples. And these are the crowds that are following him. And Matthew was one of these chosen men that, that Jesus had chosen to become an apostle. And if, if you grew up in church or you've been around here for a while, you know that Matthew didn't really have such a glorious beginning uh, in his time with Jesus because Matthew was, if I remember what Matthew was, Matthew was a tax collector. Tax collectors had very bad reputations. But that meant that he was wealthy. It also meant that he had employees. And it makes sense that Matthew, as a follower of Jesus, would actually give an account of the life of Jesus because Matthew had been working for him who were scribes. And in a scribe, they knew Aramaic, which was the language that they spoke in, in Jerusalem. And the scribes in Jerusalem and today, they probably also knew Hebrew. And for sure that they knew Greek, which was the language that everyone read and everyone spoke. And they knew how to translate and write all of these different languages. So... It just makes sense to us that in the first century, one of Jesus' disciples, namely Matthew, would give us an account of his experience with Jesus. And here's what Matthew tells us happened. This is Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. Then the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked. Now, just a quick time out here. This is Matthew's uh, giving of this detail. The reasoning for this detail is because Matthew is kind of a key word there to let us know that these Pharisees were up to something. Because they had come from Jerusalem. So they'd come seeking Jesus. They, they weren't looking for casual conversation. They were trying to trick Jesus. They were trying to trap him because that's what they always wanted to do. And, and the whole point was to separate Jesus from the crowd. They didn't want Jesus speaking to the crowd because they didn't want Jesus to have followers. And so they, they've got to get Jesus to a point where they can, they can get him away from the crowds, get him, get him you know, away from these disciples, and they think the best way to do this is to spread him. So in front of the disciples, they, they begin to question him. And this is a question that's been set up by them. They, they've talked about this before. They ask, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, as we read that in a modern context, we think, well, that's just gross. You know, that's just gross. Not to wash your hands before you eat, that's just, that's just gross. But we've got to remember where they're at. They're in the land of Judea, the land of around Jerusalem. There's very little water. Water was not something that you wasted. When they washed, they washed in a bowl because they didn't waste water. You didn't just pour water out and waste it. It was a big deal. And I need to explain why or where we're going today, why this is such a big deal. Because there's a verse in here. This, that, that says the tradition of the elder. Now, 
This is really important and a little bit hard to follow, so I'll try to do my best to explain it. But uh, this tradition of the elders was also known as the oral Torah. Now, the Torah, for a Jewish person, was the first five books of the Bible. Okay, that's what they based all of their faith on was these first five books, which have been Genesis, Exodus, it would have been uh, Deuteronomy, Leviticus. These books of the Bible gave them the law of Moses. So, so this teaching, this oral Torah, uh, basically their idea was that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, that Moses wrote these laws down, actually he took the Ten Commandments and, and made them applicable. And you can see this through Deuteronomy, Leviticus, all these books. They gave some dietary laws. They gave some laws of how to interact with each other and not break the Ten Commandments. But supposedly, in this time, there was an oral Torah, or the tradition of the elders, as it was later called. And these were laws of God that were interpreted by these Pharisees. In other words, these men just kind of added to all of this as they needed it. And, and for them, you know, they say that it was forbidden for these laws to be written down. So that puts them in a pretty unique position, doesn't it? I mean, because you're a religious leader, you're coming up with your own laws. It's forbidden to write them down. You know, only a few people's going to know this. It's always going to be a small group of men. And, and they would bring it out and they would apply it to people as it was convenient. What a way to manipulate people. And they and they did. They did this all the time. And sometimes this oral tradition of the elders, this interpreted law by these Pharisees, it, it seemed to be in conflict. You know, it seemed, to, it seemed to be in conflict with what was written in the Bible, in the Torah, these, these scriptures for these people. So the problem with this law and all of these non-written laws is that it made God very small. And it made God very petty because these were petty little things like washing your hands before you eat. You know, these were all just petty little things that made God very small. And Jesus wasn't buying it. Jesus wasn't buying any of it. He says to them, oh really? You know, they said, why, why don't they wash their hands? And, and Jesus actually says in verse, he says, oh really? And, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? In other words, he's saying, you guys... Just, just take these traditions and you use them to manipulate people when it's convenient for you. Every time they do something you don't want them to do, then you go, oh well, in the tradition of the elders and the written, unwritten law, you know, this is what it says. And you manipulate people. And he points out their hypocrisy. And then you may know this if you grew up in church. He begins to give them this amazing illustration. He says, you have these unwritten, mysterious laws that only you seem to know in order to actually get around the written law of God. And in this particular instance, this written law they were getting around relates to your aging parents. Now, this is important to know. Within the Bible, within the, the Old Testament, Moses had written down some laws about your parents. And simply those laws were, as they got older, you didn't kick them to the curb. As they got older, it was your responsibility as a child to take care of your aging parents. I mean, you brought them into your household. There were all kinds. I see Becky looking at Lydia going, yep, you listen to this. <laughs> but it was your responsibility to take care of your aging parents. It was you to take, you to take care of them financially, physically, you know, medically, whatever it meant. You were to take care of your aging parents. And all of a sudden, they had this oral law that circumvented this law that God had given Moses to write down. And what Jesus was saying is, you guys are hypocrites. When you do that, you're actually nullifying the Word of God, the written Word of God for your tradition. And he says, you hypocrites. In other words, instead of doing what's clear, you come up with some rules that nobody knows about so that you don't have to do the clear thing. Look at what he says here. He says, honor your father and mother. This is what is written. He says, honor your father and mother. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. He says, thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Once again, he uses that word, hypocrites. 
And he goes on to pull out a piece of Old Testament scripture from the book of Isaiah, from the prophets. And he quotes Isaiah to basically make his point. And he uses this quote from Isaiah as we're going to discover in a very, very profound insight. And this is going to drive our discussion for the next few weeks. And here's what he said. This is God speaking through Isaiah and Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. He says simply this. These people honor me with their lips. But with their hearts, they are very far from me. They worship me in vain, and their teachings are merely human rules. In other words, they've learned to say all the right things. And are you ready for this? But their hearts are far from me. In other words, they're playing a game. They turn your religion into a game that they can always win. They can always manipulate it, and they can always win it. And I don't need to tell you this, but there are many religious leaders out there today that have a tendency of doing this very thing. There are religious systems out there today that have a tendency of doing this thing, creating rules to their religion so that only they can win. And when this happens, they're always able to win the religious game. And they use those rules to manipulate people. And I will tell you this. If you're ever part of a church, if you're ever part of a congregation and someone's up there and they begin talking about all these rules, the do's and don'ts, or you're out, you're not going to be in with God, you better run for the door. Because God makes that clear in His Word. You don't need someone to come up with a vision from, for, from God to give to you of how you can be in fellowship with God. God tells you right in His written Word. Well, as Jesus is going through this teaching, a crowd begins to gather. And I love this because there was such a tension in Jerusalem and in Judea around the temple leaders and the law keepers and the Pharisees because they had diluted the actual teaching of God on Mount Sinai and, and, and just manipulated it to their own benefit. So whenever Jesus can kind of make people look foolish, a crowd always seems to gather. So Jesus, he looks around, he's got the crowd, and he kind of drops a bomb on them, and then he just walks away. You know, and, and here's what he said once the crowd is there. Here's what he says to the Pharisees. Jesus called to the crowd and he said, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. He says, listen and understand. What goes into your mouth by accident is the inference here. What goes into your mouth by accident, you know, because it isn't washed properly or it's not part of one of your rules or something. But what goes into someone's mouth accidentally does not defile them. In other words, it doesn't put them at odds with God. Because God is not small. God is not petty. He's not the gotcha God that's sitting here waiting to pounce on you if you do one little thing wrong. And he's not going to put you in time out for some minor, you know, accidental breach of etiquette. And Jesus says, and he kind of leans in when he says it. He says, but I'll tell you what. I'll tell you. What comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. And at this point, Jesus just leaves. He doesn't say another word. He just walks away. And the disciples are thinking to themselves, what just happened? What, what, what just happened here? And Matthew, you know, according to Matthew, who was writing this account, who was there, the disciples felt like they needed to bring it to Jesus' attention, as if Jesus needed their help, that he had just offended the Pharisees, these teachers of the law. And Jesus says, I love this line, he says to them, he says, leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. You ever heard that song I was saying, the blind leading the blind? Right there in Scripture. comes straight from the Bible. He says, look guys, you leave them. You leave them. Once upon a time, it was okay to follow them when they were following God's law. But they have so abandoned God's law, they have so abandoned God's intent, that they have made religion a business. You leave them because they are blind guys and they are going to lead you into a pit. Now, here's the problem. And then we'll get to how this affects you and me. Here's the problem. When he said what he said about it doesn't matter what you put inside of you. It matters what comes out of your mouth. That sort of thing. It sounded like he was dismissing the entire Mosaic law. 
as it related to the dietary law, those laws that Moses wrote in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and through there. I mean, it sounded like he was just dismissing those, which was not what he was doing. Because Jesus never did violate the law. In fact, Jesus kept the law perfectly. But it seems like what Moses had said, he was teaching something different. So Peter, Peter's kind of the, the ringleader of these guys there. Peter, he kind of speaks up for the group here in this moment because there's a little confusion going on. And Peter says this. He says, explain this parable to us. And what Jesus says next, it sounds like Jesus is being stern and abrasive. And maybe he was, but honestly, as I read this, I don't think so. I think he just kind of ruffled Peter's feathers a little bit. And he says, really? Are you still so dull? You know, I mean, really, guys? You're, you're not getting this? Are, are, seriously? Come on, guys. Step it up. Pay attention. You know, you still don't get it. And then he begins to explain what's going on here. And if you haven't been paying attention so far, you've been thinking about lunch, tune back in because this is really important. In this next moment, in this next statement, Jesus allows us to catch a glimpse of what is most valuable to him and what is most important to his heavenly father. In this next statement, Jesus kind of tips his hat once again to what is most important to God and what is most important to him and what should be important to you and to I. And here's what he has to say. He says, are you so dull? And then this is so cool. In fact, I think this is some humor from Jesus, but we don't get that usually because, well, we're reading the Bible and, you know, the Bible couldn't possibly have anything humorous in there. I mean, it's the Bible, right? But we need to stop and realize something. Within Scripture, these stories within Scripture, these are real people. These are real people. These are real situations. These are real relationships. And I believe that this is kind of Jesus' humor. So Jesus kind of stops and, and he said, oh, you're so dull, you still don't get it. And then I think he smiles and I think he looks at the disciples and says, look, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth, it goes into the stomach and then out of the body? And I can imagine the disciples sitting around going, yeah, it happens twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. You know, and they're thinking, okay, I get that. He says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And these defile them. Now, here's Jesus' point. If, 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 if something by chance that's off limits, you know, if you eat that or you take that in, in, in this time of the Old Testament, you know, it's going to go straight through your body, come out, no harm done to anyone. And then he straight up says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth, this is what comes from the heart. And the, and, and the inference here is that your Heavenly Father is more concerned about what comes out of your mouth than what goes into your mouth. He's not so concerned about those laws as he is the intent. In fact, the things that come out of here, he says, those are the things, and he kind of uses this religious word, those are the things that defile men. And this carried some religious implications because to be defiled went that you were at odds with God. So what he's saying here is, you want to know what will put you at odds with God? It's not accidentally eating the wrong thing. It's not accidentally violating the tradition. It's not accidentally doing anything. The thing that will put you at odds with God is when what comes out of your mouth puts you at odds with the people that God what comes out of your mouth can put us at odds with the people, which puts us at odds with God. And this was a whole theme of Jesus' teaching over and over again, that God loves the you, and he loves the you behind you. He loves the you next to you. He loves the you in front of you. He loves the you beside you at work, beside you in your car, beside you in your neighborhood. God loves those people as he loves you. So when you do anything to intentionally hurt someone that God loves, then God is concerned about that. Because that's something coming out of your mouth that comes from your heart. That is how Jesus says you defile yourself. And Jesus says, and this is so powerful, but the things that come out of a person's mouth, they come from the heart of that person. 
In other words, they originate from within. They originate from within our heart. And these are the things inside of us that eventually come out of us. These are the things that will put us at odds with God. Because they put us at odds with the people that God loves. The source, he says, of your defiling, the source of your offenses, the source of your problematic words, your problematic deeds, is within you. Now, when you hear that, I don't know how you respond to that. You may go, oh, you haven't told me anything I don't already know. Or maybe you kind of push back and you say, whoa, 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 whoa. come on, Tony. Now, not everything I say comes from my heart, and sometimes I say things that I don't mean. I think Jesus, in this situation, I think he would push back, and I think he might say this. You mean what you say is sometimes you say things that you don't mean to say out loud, but you meant them because they came out of you. And in that moment, when your behavior skills were at a weakened moment because of an emotion or a situation, in that moment, your heart was showing. It came out of you because it was in you. Here's what Jesus said, actually. He says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. They're not eating with unwashed hands. That is not defiling. What he's saying here is everything begins with a thought. He said, out of the heart come evil thoughts of murder. Every murder that takes place begins with with a thought. Adultery begins in the mind and in the heart. And I love what the gospel writer of Mark says. I mean, Mark records this, this whole conversation also. And he added some other things that Jesus said. That, that, that greed comes from the heart. Malice comes from the heart. Deceit, envy, arrogance. And I love this word that he uses because we don't use it anymore. anymore. He says, and folly comes from the heart. And you know what folly is. Folly is just bad judgment. And I guarantee your greatest regrets relationally were the result of bad judgment or unwise decision. It was the result of folly in your heart. Because you look back and you think, how could I have been so foolish? How could I have been so stupid? Why would I do such a thing? Well, it's because folly was in your heart. Those embarrassing, despicable, relationship-killing, career-killing, financial debilitating behaviors, Jesus says their source is in your heart. And he says, guys, ladies, these are the things that defile a person. These are the things that put you at odds with God because these are the things that put you at odds with the people that God loves. But he says, come on, eating with unwashed hands, that ain't good. That's not going to be worth this. So here's what I want to do for the next week. Next few weeks are going to be a little bit tricky. Next few weeks are going to be really interesting because we're going to be teaching some of these, these things and how we can go past this. But what I'm hoping to do is that we're going to put into practice uh, of how we are monitoring our hearts. We're going to raise the bar with that. You know, we're going to begin monitoring that thing in us that is the source of evil. You know, oftentimes that thing that comes out of us in an emotional time. We're actually going to personalize some of this stuff we're in, we're going to actually personify some of this stuff, uh, which the Apostle Paul actually models for us in some of his teachings. James models it in some of his teachings. And we're going to get in the habit of listening to the voices in our head and determine if they are the same voices that's in our heart. So let's learn to pay attention about what's in there because I know that, well, I know that what is in there is going to come out of there at some point. Just like it does for me, just like it does for you, just like it does for everyone. And here's why this is so important, whether you're a religious person or not. The people closest to you, they're the ones that's experiencing the overflow of your heart right now every single day. And you're experiencing the overflow of their heart just as well. And for some of us, I think it's time that maybe we take that look in the mirror. That we get at a better position of monitoring our hearts more than we are, not just simply monitoring our behavior, that we begin to listen to the right voice that is speaking to us and turn away from those voices that oftentimes want to rule over us. 
I want to give you an invitation this morning as I ask my musicians to come back forward. I want to give you the invitation, as I always do every week. Listening to the voices that are the bright voices, that begins with following Jesus. It begins with a simple yes to Jesus' invitation to come and follow me. And if you've never made that, that decision just to follow me, I want to give you that opportunity today. I want to ask you to just go ahead and stay around after.